This is It Is Written. I'm John Bradshaw. Thanks for joining me today. Today I'm joined by a special guest. Dr. Michael Kafferke is a professor of business and management. He's authored multiple books and has lectured around the world in the area of business ethics. When you come to the Bible, the Bible is a book filled with ethics. In fact, I was speaking to some non-Christian kids in Mongolia, of all places. I asked them what they knew about the Bible. None of the children knew anything at all, except for one who said, it's a book that deals with God and is about ethics, which is fair, I think. Business ethics. How do we bring ethics into our daily lives and why does it even matter? Dr. Kafferke, thanks so much for joining me today. Glad to be here. Thank you. Now, you write about and you teach on the subject of ethics. In front of me, I have the cover of your new book, published any day now, Business Ethics in Biblical Perspective. InterVarsity Press have published this book. Tell me, let's start right at the beginning. We're going to bring this around to a personal application. We'll look at this from a very biblical point of view. What is business ethics? Well, it's about doing the right thing, but it's also about the process of deciding what is the right thing to do. And so we're really talking about, when we talk about ethics, we're talking about a process of thinking and a process of doing that is based upon some standard of right and wrong, either a standard that maybe I might get myself or that I find outside of myself, perhaps in the Bible. Is ethics and morality the same thing? Well, morality would be the standards of right and wrong. Ethics is the process of applying those standards and trying to figure out now, okay, what is right and wrong in this particular situation? So why are ethics so important, or maybe I should say how important are ethics when you come to a, a, a business situation? Whether you're a religious person or not, whether you're a Christian or believe in some other religion, or no religion, Business ethics is really important just for the business itself. It turns out that uh, research shows that businesses who are, are ethical, are following a standard of right and wrong, tend to recruit employees, loyal employees, that contribute more to their company. So it's, it helps in recruiting new employees. It helps in retaining workers who also like to work in a situation where there's uh, standards of right and wrong that are held to. Uh, it, research also shows that your stock price can actually go up if you're an ethical organization. So it's really important. So what are some organizations, I'm not asking so much for your opinion as the general <laughs> consensus, what are some organizations that are considered to have ethics figured out well? Oh, wow. Uh, I think there's, once in a while there's a list published, and I forget where it's published, of uh, the best, best places to work, okay. for instance. Uh, certain many of the Fortune 100 and 500 corporations are considered to be the, some of the best places to work. Which would buttress the idea we spoke of a moment ago. If you have ethics going well, your business tends to do better. Sure. Okay. And then let's take it. Let's take it. Scale it down to the small business. Uh, viewers in their own community will know of, of organizations, maybe uh, family businesses that have been in town for many years, and they know which businesses are the ethical businesses. They trust those businesses. They repeat business as buyers, or they'll repeat as sellers to those businesses. They like doing business with people who are ethical. Let's talk about this from a broad perspective. Can you give me an example of uh, an ethical question that was raised? Maybe it made the news, or maybe in the academic circles, it's a good case study of a an ethical question that was addressed one way or another. What can we discuss? Well, I think of the, uh, the story of an executive of a food, uh, a chain of food stores in New England. And there was a bit of a power struggle at the level of the, the governance level of the board. And this executive was let go by a, a relative who was also on the board and had gathered board, board support, let go. Many employees said, you know, this won't stand, and we're going to walk off the job. Okay, that raises a really important question. First of all, is there grounds for firing this person? That's one ethical question. Okay, so now he's fired. Uh, what about the employees who say, you know, that wasn't right to fire him, and so we're going to walk. Is that the right thing to do? How do we determine then what is the right thing to do? do oh, we, yeah. Is this consensus? Uh, do we take a vote, or, or 
what processes ought yeah. to guide the way you figure out what's ethical in a given situation? Yeah. That really is the big question. How do we go about figuring out what is right and wrong and what is the process we use? There are some people who say, well, there really are no standards of right and wrong. And so whatever you think is right, then that's right. That would be what we call an egoist approach, right? There are others who kind of take the opposite point of view and say, no, there are absolute standards. Let's have a conversation about those standards and how they best apply to this particular situation. But they are absolutes. And that would be the scriptural pr perspective for sure. So why are ethics important? I mean, I'm a businessman. I just want to make money. It's my job. I'm not here to make friends. So if I can, if I can raid a company or artificially jack up the stock price and sell out, doesn't matter who I hurt, really, why does it matter? You may well, simply say there's a question of human decency, but what if I don't care about that? Yeah, well, for some people, they can go a long time on that kind of a, a approach or philosophy of business, yes. And certainly some people might get hurt along the way, a 30 or 40 year career, that can happen. Other people, especially as we mature and get older, we say, you know, life is not just about the money. I do value relationships here among my worker, with my workers, with my family, with my community. There are a lot of reasons to start being concerned about ethics, and it has to do with our social connections with each other, it turns out. I want to bring this around and look at this from a, a, a biblical point of view. Yeah. Why, why is business ethics important for someone who, who is striving to be or desires to be faithful to God in his or her own personal yeah. experience? To me, this is, the, this is one of the big questions of what does it mean to have faith in God? Faith is not just something I think about, like a mental uh, process I go through or some mental state I get to at some point. That's part of faith. Believing, that's part of faith. But faith also is being faithful in what I do. As it says, I think, in the, the book of James, faith without works. That's his way of putting it, right? So faith really is stuff in action, things that we do, not just think... Faith is not just this sense of psychological security. Oh, I've believed the right things, therefore I must be safe now. Yeah, that's a part of it, but biblical faith is faith in action, faithfulness to God as, as part of the response of gratitude for what God has done. There's a lot here, business, ethics, and faith in God. This is where the rubber meets the road in a person's life. It's more than what you think, it's how your faith plays out in everyday life. We'll have more in just a moment. It may seem that integrity is in short supply, but it does not need to be in short supply in your life. I'd like you to get today's free offer, Challenged, written by Dr. Michael Kafferke and myself, how you can maintain and demonstrate integrity in your personal life or in your business life. Call us, 800-253-3000, 800-253-3000. Visit us at itiswritten.com or write to the address on your screen for Challenged. This is It Is Written. I'm John Bradshaw. Thanks for joining me today. My guest is Dr. Michael Kafferke, a professor of management and business at Southern Adventist University in Eastern Tennessee. Uh, Dr. Kafferke has authored numerous books and has lectured around the world in the areas of business ethics and faith. Dr. Kafferke, I'm interested in finding out for you, from you rather, what the Bible says about business ethics. I think this is important. A lot of business people uh, identify as believers in God. Not all of them really stop and drill down and examine themselves as to whether they're really acting ethically, whether it matters from the Bible. Mm -hmm. So what does the Bible say about ethics and business? Oh, the Bible says a lot about business and ethics, starting in Genesis. And actually, if you follow this all the way through Scripture to the book of Revelation, we even find references in the book of Revelation about business-related ethics as well. You can start in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. Some people turn to as the foundation ideas for why God created this earth, how he put human beings here on this earth, and some of the basic ideas and, and principles uh, upon which life was started. Give me a for instance. We don't have to recite chapter and verse exactly, but, but let's look at an idea just so we get an understanding of what it is we're talking about yeah. here. 
uh, an, an ethical situation or a commentary on business ethics that we find okay. in the early chapters okay. of the Bible. Uh, there is this idea from ancient times of when people were buying and selling goods, they would use a piece of technology that we would call a scale, weigh, a weighing scale, right? And you would put product on one side of the scale and weights on the other, and when they measured equal, then you'd know that here's the, here's the value for that product, and then there's a price associated. Okay, so that's the technology. The scripture talks about these scales and how the trader must be very careful not to have false weights or a secret set of weights in the bag, it's called, because they used to carry these weights in a bag, right? Don't use a false set of weights to cheat your customer when you're selling product. Uh, the book of Proverbs takes up this same, same idea. Solomon the king uh, recites this same idea during his kingship. Don't use false weights when you're trading. Let me ask you this. Is there a lot of dishonesty in business today? Well, there is, unfortunately. But you know, the, the marketplace would not work if dishonesty was rampant everywhere. In fact, that's one of the principles upon which a market economy is founded, the experts have said. Uh, you've got to be honest. Yes, there, it is true that some people are dishonest, but generally people have to be honest in order for the marketplace to work, right? There are certain things that we put in place as, as protections and, and boundaries. We hire accountants, for instance, to help us be honest. Auditors. Auditors to keep records, transparency of the information so we can trust. That's another issue, of course, related to honesty, is trust. Uh, so honesty is absolutely important. And yes, people are dishonest. But if the majority of people weren't honest in a free market, it would collapse fairly quickly. Okay, let's get back to the Bible. Mm -hmm. Let's look at a couple of other situations. Yeah, let's talk about the Ten Commandments briefly. Mm. Now, many people think the Ten Commandments is simply kind of a random list of ten things that you shouldn't do. Or some things are said you should do, a few things are said in the negative don't do. Right? And it's kind of a random. Actually, when you look carefully and study these Ten Commandments, all of them are related to business and business activities from the point of view of the, uh, the people of those times. Now, do you mind if I read a commandment to you? And we'll, uh, we'll see how this is associated with ethics. Okay, okay. Can we do that? And there are a couple, and I'm wondering how might this one be associated with ethics. Okay. I'll give you a nice easy one. Thou shalt, okay. not, thou shalt not steal. Oh, good. You started with the easy there one. Yeah, go. that's the most obvious one yeah. of the, all of the ten. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, thou shalt not steal. Well, just think about it. If stealing were rampant in the marketplace, how much trading of things of value would people actually engage in? If I thought that what I bought today, someone would come and steal tomorrow, why would I go and, and, and buy something that I know someone's going to take from me? Very quick. See, what happens in theft, it's, it's not only a disrespect of the person who worked hard to earn the money to buy the product that they owned, right? It's a disrespect of them, but it's also a disrespect to the creator who created all things from which that product was made as well. Okay. Um, but just think about that. If, if, we, if we didn't trust the safety of things that we owned using our hard-earned money, uh, the economy would, would tank. Mm. Thou shalt not kill? Oh, my. This is it's not quite so obvious, but it is, it is so clear that without physical safety in the marketplace, there would not be trading. If I cannot feel safe going out to the market and buying and sell, right, safety for my own physical well-being, health, and even for my life. Again, the same impact on the economy, it would tank. Does this mean that questions of occupational safety and health, oh, sure. uh, safety in, in, within the working environment, those are ethical questions too? Well, of course, and that's the positive side of thou shalt not kill commandment, right? The, the positive side is let's foster flourishing life for people who we are with, who we have responsibility for, our workers, our family, and our, our neighbors. So yes, occupational safety is a positive expression of that commandment, thou shalt not kill. There's a, there's a commandment in the, in the Bible that's been pretty well forgotten by everybody. It's the last one, uh -oh. Exodus 20 verse 19, mm. thou shalt not covet. Oh, yeah. where's, the, where's the business ethics in covetousness? <laughs> God designs for us 
to have a flourishing life. Okay. And that flourishing life, from the scripture point of view, includes several dimensions. I'm going to come to the business part, so just work with me here okay, for a minute. Sure. Uh, first of all, our spiritual relationship with God. That's part of the flourishing, the foundation for a flourishing life. Social harmony with our, our family and friends in the community. Even international peace, right? That's part of this flourishing life. Physical health and well-being, mental health. And there's another dimension that Scripture also includes in this idea of flourishing life, the economic dimension. Oh, yeah. If we don't put some limits on the economic dimension of our, of our life, of this flourishing life, it turns out the other dimensions start to suffer. And the, the Tenth Commandment, I'm going to come around to that Tenth Commandment, thou shalt not covet, is a way to put some boundaries around our economic activities. Why should those boundaries be there? You're telling me that I can't maximize my earning potential or I, sh I shouldn't pad my wallet as much as I might like? The scripture is clear. God desires for us abundance. He tells us in the fourth commandment, work hard six days a week, right? But the seventh, I know this is the fourth commandment, but it's kind of related to the tenth because there's a similar principle of being content with what we, what we get from the, the fruits of our labor. So yes, work hard. Uh, absolutely, achieve abundance, but if we don't put constraints on our efforts to achieve abundance, it turns out that we start hurting people around us. We start destroying physical and mental health when we don't put constraints on that economic activity. Business ethics, quite a field of study, and Dr. Kaffick has studied it more than most. We'll be back with more about ethics, business, the Bible, and you in just a moment. In Matthew 4.4, the Word of God says, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Every Word is a one-minute Bible-based daily devotional presented by Pastor John Bradshaw and designed especially for busy people like you. Look for Every Word on selected networks or watch it online every day on our website, itiswritten.com. Receive a daily spiritual boost. Watch Every Word. You'll be glad you did. Here's a sample. Thanks for joining me. The reality is we live in the midst of a spiritual battle. Someone wants you to be saved. God who offers you salvation through Jesus, Jesus who died for your sins. But there's someone who wants you not to be saved, and that's the devil, Satan. So notice Joshua 20 verse 5. Joshua is writing about the cities of refuge safe places for those who've accidentally taken a life. He says, Then if the avenger of blood pursues him, they shall not deliver the slayer into his hand, because he struck his neighbor unintentionally, but did not hate him beforehand. The person fleeing to the city of refuge had to be intentional. Why? Because there was someone pursuing him. In the same way, it's vital to remember the enormous importance of fleeing to safety in Jesus. Someone wants you to let go of eternal life. So stay close to Jesus. Dwell in him, the city of refuge. And let's live today by every word. Thanks for joining me today on It Is Written. My guest, Dr. Michael Kafferke, has written extensively about business and ethics and how it relates to a person's relationship with Jesus Christ. A couple of moments ago, Dr. Kafferke, we were discussing uh, the Ten Commandments and their right. role in ethics and business. And you mentioned right. something interesting. When we discuss killing and stealing and, and, and lying, these are pretty clear ethical questions. Yeah. The Bible says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Right. How do we relate that to a question of business ethics? Oh, this is, this is fascinating. This question will take us a, you know, a little bit deeper to understanding the Sabbath as, as something bigger and wonderful than just a day of worship, although the day of worship is really important. In fact, that's the, kind of the foundation, taking a day from work, not working, to worship in community uh, our God. Okay, so worship of God in community, that's kind of the heart of the Sabbath. But Sabbath is also about being content with what I have earned, what I've gained from my labors. Six days you shall work, it says, and do all your, all your labor, but the seventh day is the Sabbath and keep the Sabbath holy, right? So six days of work, but let's be content with what we did earn and obtain. 
from our efforts. That's, that's central to the Sabbath commandment. Now, you've written extensively about, about a couple of concepts dealing with the heart and, and the, the walk, a person's yeah. walk. Because they're Bible ideas. Yeah. yeah. Let's, let's talk about that. Let's talk about the walk particularly. I don't know if that's all we'll have time for. So let's talk about that. What, okay. is, what is this walk, walk issue and how does that impact us from an ethical point of view? Well, the, that's an image of Scripture or a metaphor that Scripture uses several times. Moses uses it in his writings. And it's used in other places as well. It's actually used in the New Testament and the Old Testament. So the walk refers to our activities in, in the community. When we're with other people, things that we do that other people see, we're walking, meaning we are behaving in certain ways that affect other people. That's the walk. Let me, let me share a passage of the Scripture sure. from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and um, verse 6. This follows one of the famous sayings of Scripture, the famous, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. That's the, just a famous from, from ancient times. In verse 6, These words which I command you this day shall be upon your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way. Is he talking about, okay, let's take a hike down in the mountains and we're going to have a conversation about the Ten Commandments? Now what is he talking the, about? Here? He's talking about when we move outside of our tent or our little house, go out, we're walking out into the community to do our business, our buying and our selling. That's when these principles of the Ten Commandments should be on our hearts, our minds, and on our lips to have conversations with people. You see, business is a moral activity. It's not just amoral money-making from the Scripture point of view. It's moral activity. It's, it reflects our relationship with God. And so the walking by the way, or the, the walking means doing our life, doing our business of life with other people. The Bible speaks a lot about business, doesn't it? Maybe more than many people would even know. It does. In fact, there are, we read a lot of passages about love, redemption. Those are wonderful themes. Scripture talks a lot about money, how we earn our money, how we spend our money. Uh, the principles in which we should relate to each other, the work of managers, for instance, uh, which are fascinating ideas, and they, they form a wonderful perspective, if you will, uh, uh, and they relate to our entire life, not just our life in church and life in our family, but life in the marketplace as well. Business people, clearly, particularly people of, uh, in business who claim to have some sort of moral code, who claim to be answerable mm -hmm. to God, clearly ought to be thinking strongly about how, how the Bible shapes and forms their ethical practices. It's true for individuals, though, too, people who yeah. don't run businesses, but they're living their lives, because right. we all conduct business, don't we? <laughs> oh, yes. Whether it's with the, the company with which we have our cell phone plan or, yeah. or the, the, the convenience store up the street. Each of us is a buyer. It takes two to do business, a buyer and a seller. Somebody has to sell something. Someone has to buy something in order for that to work. So we're, we're all buyers, all meaning each family unit, and even it is individuals, we're, we're buying and selling. And so the scripture doesn't relate just to pastors, just to Bible teachers, or just to us when we're in church. How would, how would God's message be truthful if it only applied to those aspects of our life? Going to, going to church. The times when I'm reading the Bible, that's when I'm the most righteous, right? <laughs> that's when I desire most. How about when I go to the marketplace? That's when our faith in response to God's grace to us. That's when the faith, I contend, really is shown. I'm going to ask you a question that you're not expecting. Recently, I was in a country where you visit the market and you oh. say, how much is this oh, bowl? Yeah. And they say, yeah. 250. And you know that they're, they're highballing you. Mm -hmm. But you've got to come back and, and barter and with that person. Negotiate. Mm -hmm. How do you do that ethically? Oh, and wow. keep this in mind, you're in a third world country and you've come from a first right. world country with comparatively right. a pocket stuff yeah. full of money. How does a person go about that sort of, it could be you saw something on Craigslist and you want to buy a car and they're asking for eight and a half thousand dollars and you don't want to pay right. that much. How do we enter into something like that guided by biblical yeah. ethics? One of the biblical principles, which is a, a theme of scripture, is called, it's called wisdom. Okay. Wisdom is not just knowledge about the market, but it includes that. But wisdom comes from the community that I'm a part of. And so the wise thing to do 
would be to say, okay, I'm going to find out as much as I can about the marketplace here before I start negotiating and you know, enter into transactions. If I let someone take advantage of me, and this is a scriptural idea, if I let someone take advantage of me, they're taking advantage of the community. And so to follow God in a faithful way, I'm going to try to avoid that. So I might do some research. In, a, in another country, I might take someone with me if I, if I knew someone who lived in that marketplace or in that community, someone with me to the marketplace to have a conversation about the prices and, the, and so forth of the products. I think we're about out of time, but this is fascinating because we all live our lives, we all conduct business on some level, yeah. and we all ought to be guided by something, particularly if yes. we're believers in God. We want that to be the Bible. We want our ethics to be formed by biblical principles. Dr. Michael right. Kafferke, thanks so much for joining me today. Pleasure being here. Ethics and the Bible, our relationship with God. Certainly as we reach out after God, we want God to guide us in the right way, that we're not only representing Him, but our lives are characterized by God's character, and that that's what we reflect to the world in all our dealings. It may seem that integrity is in short supply, but it does not need to be in short supply in your life. I'd like you to get today's free offer, Challenged, written by Dr. Michael Kafferke and myself, how you can maintain and demonstrate integrity in your personal life or in your business life. Call us, 800-253-3000, 800-253-3000. Visit us at itiswritten.com or write to the address on your screen for Challenged. I'm glad you've joined me today. Why don't we take a moment to pray together? Our Father in heaven, we thank you today for Jesus. We thank you for a life that was lived ethically, morally pure, righteously. We failed you many times, but we want our lives to be characterized like Jesus' life with the presence and the power of the God of heaven. Bless us that in all we do, only Jesus would be seen, that we would represent you right and experience the joy of a life filled with abundance abundance of your presence and your blessing. We thank you today and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Dr. Kafferke, thanks so much for joining me today. This has been a blessing. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Let's do this again sometime. Thanks so much. And thank you for joining me today. I look forward to seeing you again next time. Until then, please remember, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God.